I am a senior technical product manager at Zillow, which is um, in downtown. I'm working on a new Zillow product called Zillow Offers, which is a, uh, a new venture for the company, a very new significant venture for the company where we're actually buying and selling houses directly from consumers as a way to um, uh, ease and um, provide a very cohesive, very seamless experience for uh, people buying and selling houses. So specifically though, I work on the platform side. So we have a lot of internal teams that are doing all sorts of things in the field. So I build software for those different teams and I manage the underlying data platform um, for the organization. So it's a pretty technical back end product management role, which is different than what I was doing before at Boeing, where it was more front end work um, and UI work. Okay, so tonight, hopefully you're here for the right presentation. I'm gonna talk about user-centered iterative product development. Um, when I say user-centered iterative product development, in a lot of ways, this is agile, right? This is agile product development, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, so let's get started. Okay, so uh, as I said, I'm gonna to talk to you about user-centered iterative product development um, or agile product development. Uh, there's some debate as to whether that's fair to say user-centered iterative product development is agile product development. For tonight, I'm going to say that it is. We can talk about it more afterwards. Um, but so I want to break down the terms user-centered and iterative before I dig into anything else. So agile first or iterative product development is an iterative approach to software delivery that builds software incrementally from the start of the project instead of trying to deliver all of the value and all of the functionality at once. And uh, user-centered design is an iterative design process. I promise I won't read too many definitions. In an iterative design process in which designers focus on the users and their needs in each phase of the design process. So in user-centered designer UCD, the primary measure of um, success for a product is software that's usable, useful, and meaningful to the software's end user. That's a very significant innovation, innovation, if you will, because it's very direct towards the end user instead of being that if we deliver business value, then inherently we deliver user value, which is not always true. So then user-centered iterative software development is the merging of those two concepts of user-centered design principles and then agile software development principles. And I'm gonna go into a little bit more about that tonight. Um, the agile as a, as a concept, as a product development um, approach came about as an innovation on traditional product development or waterfall, typically product development is what it's called. And it is, it, there's a long story about agile, but it was early nine, uh, early 2000s actually, I believe, like 2001 is when Agile was like officially created and there's an Agile manifesto and you can read all about it. But uh, software developers in particular recognized that, that software didn't need to be developed in the same way that hardware needed to be developed. And that opened up a lot of new opportunities for how to develop product in a very different way. And that's been a very, that was a very significant innovation in how product is developed and then it's matured even further to now incorporate, in my opinion, a lot of these user-centered design principles. So you, you continue to see the innovation sort of away from traditional and towards sort of something new that's worked really well for a lot of um, software companies. So I want to start with, I explained a little bit about Waterfall. Waterfall has been around for a really long time. It's, it's, a way, it's based in manufacturing and hardware development traditionally where you sort of got to make sure that what you're going to build is the thing you're going to build and that what you intend to build is what you actually build because with hardware, you can't rewind or change something when manufacturing has already started. Um, so it, it requires what's like big upfront design or all this analysis and planning up front to make sure that once you get into building out the hardware or this product, that everything just runs smoothly. Um, and the role of project manager, which is different than product manager, comes is, is very often found in waterfall models because the planning of the system, the design, the architecture, the manufacturing of that product is all decided up front. And then you need someone to help oversee the execution of that plan. 
and sort of follow a schedule in order to hit whatever deliverables there are, um, or gates sometimes is what they're called. And so a project manager sometimes can do that work and make sure that things are on track. Okay, so I want to give you an example of what Waterfall is quickly. It's sort of a dumb, simple example, but I think it will highlight sort of what Waterfall is, and then we'll switch to user-centered iterative product development or Agile, and so we can compare and contrast the two. So uh, let's say that there's a software uh, engineering organization, a software engineering organization that works in a large company, and someone high up above goes, go solve this user's problem. Right? So the software development team goes, okay, we're going to go solve their problems. In the waterfall model, everything starts with requirement analysis and gathering. So this is like, what are the requirements of the system that we're going to build? What's all the functionality? What's all the different little uh, nuances of it that we're going to have to do? And let's really understand what the users want up front so then we can figure out what we're going to build and then move along in the process. So that's the requirements analysis uh, stage. They go out, they talk to users, they have tons of meetings with them, they bring everyone together, and you know this is a new tool for the whole org, so everyone has opinions, right? And so they have a huge list of all these different features. So let's say they go out, they're talking to the users, and the users go, we really need a new way to take notes, I'm using a simple example here, right? And so, uh, Okay, you need notes, well, tell us, like, what more do you need? Let us watch you, let us better understand. And they go, well, it's a note-taking app, so we need creating, editing, and deleting of those notes. Oh, but by the way, I'm on this other team over here. I need sharing functionality, real-time collaboration, font editing. I need diagram, diagram creation functionality, reminders, labels integration with the calendar, and, and everything's got to work on mobile and, and web and a desktop because we have people in the field and we have people here, right? So, you, so you, you went out, you spent maybe weeks or months really understanding what the user wants, and now you have your list of requirements. So you got, you, you know, our team goes back into our, into our office, and now we start sort of synthesizing those requirements and organizing them. And so from then, you start designing the system and architecting the system and you go, okay, well, what's the back-end architecture? If we need this integration, then you're going to need these APIs and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it's very, very comprehensive. You have very comprehensive architecture diagrams and design diagrams and designers have spent months now building every button and UI and every little piece of this functionality. Everything's planned. Okay, so now at this point, at, the, at this point, We've gathered our requirements, we've converted them into designs, architectures, our plan, and now we need to execute. So now we sort of move into the next phase of, in Waterfall there's these phases, these are the different phases. We move into the development phase is what it's called of Waterfall. So in this case, we know we need to build, we just need to build it. So it's like, well, where do we start? Like, if it's A to Z, let's start at A, we'll move all the way to Z, right? Because it really doesn't matter, we have to build the whole thing before we can deliver it or the users can use it, et cetera. So it really just doesn't matter. We'll start someplace and we'll get to the end eventually. So once it's all developed, oh wow, it's really cool and nice in the lab, it's all working. Now we're gonna do testing on it, right? So maybe you've spent, and I'm being serious here, typically Waterfall can take you know months, if not years, to build a product. Um, and when you look at even hardware with, with Waterfall, it can take you know, decades type of thing. So now we're in this testing phase, but keep in mind we've spent maybe a year and a half building this note-taking app, and now we're, we're gonna test out the functionality. Do all the integrations work? Uh, do we have all the buttons we need? Oh man, we're missing, we forgot about that requirement. Someone needs to go do that, blah, 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 right? And then we're gonna deploy it, because now it's all ready. And now here you go, users, here's your note-taking app two years later and now you maintain it. And that's the waterfall process. Okay, so we get to deployment, we get to maintenance. So again, two years later, uh, here you go users, here's the product. But unfortunately, by this time, no one needs the desktop application anymore. Because it's two years later and now we're all on mobile. So that was six months of product development down the drain. And oh man, the calendar integration doesn't work because the system moved to, to Google Calendar from the, the Outlook clients. So we got to go back and fix that. 
And now we're talking about two years, three years, etc. Right, and you just sort of like get into this pattern where you like can't get ahead of this stuff and the system becomes this weight that you have to carry around. It's like all this debt that you have to carry around and you don't want to get rid of it because you just put two years into it. It's like a little bit of a sunk cost fallacy. So it can go south pretty quickly. That being said, Waterfall works, has worked brilliantly for especially American like uh, uh, aerospace companies and industrial companies. I mean, the country wouldn't be where it was today without Waterfall. So it is a fantastic way of developing product. It just requires a lot of patience and things most of the time take longer, et cetera. So let's talk about the user-centered iterative product development methodology or the agile way, right? Agile product development. Just like before, we're gonna go out and talk to users. Users are critical and essential to user-centered at uh, iterative product development. They're at the core of everything we're trying to do. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go understand what users need and want. The difference is, is that we may start by looking broadly at all of the different users who, may, who we may be able to work with first, but eventually we're gonna narrow down the scope and say there's a most important opportunity in here that we're gonna start with. And that's where we're really gonna dive deep into the user's overall experience and really understand what it is that, um, what they're doing today, what their pain points are, and how we can deliver value to them. Uh, the other piece of this is that when we're doing our research in a user-centered design, user-centered fashion, the research is gonna feel and look different. We'll probably have meetings with the managers and the stakeholders and these different people involved but the real research is from sitting with the users, surveying the users, talking to the users, and really understanding what it is that they're doing on a daily basis, what it is that their pain points are. A lot of times users don't necessarily know what their pain points are, but if you have a well-trained eye and an education in these user-centered design practices, you'll pick things up. Okay, so we've started, but we've already started off out in a little bit of a different way where we're a little bit more focused Right? We're not trying to solve everyone's needs at once, generally speaking, and we're really getting the real story because we're sitting with the users and watching what they do. We're not just trusting their, their word, if you will. Um, and I'll talk about that later. So, okay, so we go, okay, we're gonna, take, we're gonna make a note-taking app, but you know what, the, the absolute, the biggest problem they're having is that they just need basic note-taking functionality. They have no place right now. They can't use Microsoft Word. They can't use Google Docs. They have no place to take notes. So let's just build a very thin slice of value, which is, sorry, Brian, which is uh, creating notes, editing notes, and deleting notes. And that's it. We know, we know users, you guys have a lot more problems and a lot more things you need to do. But let us start here, and then we'll move from there. And this is already, you're seeing a contract with Waterfall. So the first step isn't even building software. It isn't even sitting down with your engineers and building anything. We would work with designers in this case who would have already been out in the field understanding the users and doing this research. We would have worked with the designers and they'll do something very simple. This is just one technique they'll do, but they'll create a paper prototype. So something like this, this is like a really fancy paper prototype, but these can get really, really simple, like even just sketched out on a sheet of paper. But what we're doing is that we're saying, okay, well, we want to give them a note-taking note application, but what does that really mean? We have ideas of what it is, but let's give them something and test it out. So like with paper prototyping, what you can do is that relatively cheaply, right? This would take someone, I know these ones are very pretty, but it would take someone a few hours to draw them and cut it out and stuff. And I know it sounds silly, but this is super cheap compared to an hour or two of software developers' time and all the setup and blah, 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 blah. And so in this situation, we can go back to the user, sit them down, and this is really done uh, very often, and have them use a initial prototype for just creating, editing, and deleting photos. And we immediately, oh, they couldn't find the button, or oh, we forgot to have a way to save the notes or you, you learn all sorts of things through these paper prototypes and it's a very cheap way to learn. Okay, so now we're like, oh, we got all this great feedback, right? And so now we go back and now maybe we start thinking about, okay, let's build something higher fidelity is what it's called, right? So this is a very low fidelity 
paper prototype. The other advantage of something like this to start, sorry, I don't really know where to stand, is that um, the other advantage is that with a paper prototype, people uh, from a psychological perspective really don't like telling someone who's put a lot of work into something that they don't like it. It's very awkward, especially if you don't know the person well. So if you come forward, hey, here's my new functioning iOS note-taking application, the vast majority of people are going to say, oh, that's really nice. I like it a lot. But if you give them a sort of janky sheets of paper where you're moving stuff around and whatever it is, they're going to tell you whatever they think. Because it's like they didn't even put any time into this. Right? But so you can immediately really get honest feedback and understand what it is that the users do and don't like in a very cheap way. So from there, now let's build a little bit of a higher fidelity prototype. Right? So there's a little bit more detailed. Maybe this took our designers a little bit more time. But again, we can, there's all sorts of applications online which makes this a lot easier, Sketch, Balsamic, et cetera. Um, but this becomes pretty darn cheap to do and you can replicate basically an iPhone or you know, whatever mobile or desktop application live. So you can sit down with the user, put it on their computer and they can play around with it and you ask them things. You say, can you show me how you would create a new note? Can you show me how you would edit a new note. And there's a whole art to how you do what's called this user testing or these user interviews. But so now we're at a point where it's like after we're done with this, we're like, you know what? This create, edit, and delete functionality, I feel pretty good that this is going to work off the bat. You can't be 100% sure, but you're a lot more sure than you've ever been because you've done two different iterations of testing and prototyping, etc. right? The other piece is that I've taken a long time to talk about this, but this is actually a very easy thing, right? So the, the, the paper prototypes, and I've done this personally in the past many times, the paper prototypes can be thrown together in a few hours. You can be testing that afternoon. You go back, you work a little bit the next morning on higher fidelity, um, what these are called wireframes, and you're back out with the user the next day. Right? So like in, in a week, two weeks tops, you have a tremendous amount of information that you didn't have before. Okay, so now we actually build the software and we build just create, edit, and delete functionality and we push it to production and the users can use it and it's been one month of work and the users now immediately have some value. And I'm not saying that it's going to be perfect, right? We'll probably get things wrong and we'll have missed things, but it's very narrow as to how much we've built and it's really cheap to make these changes because it, it's not so complicated yet. And so the, the process then at this point, when, once you've delivered that value and made iterations to sort of fix that initial functionality, will then repeat over and over and over until you've satisfied many different users, many different pain points, many different use cases. Let's talk about the advantages of this agile approach or this user-centered iterative software development approach over waterfall. It is like a classic diagram which is that in waterfall it's like left to right you do this and then this and then this and then this and that's what we talked about. It's really about your approach to delivering the product. Um, okay so let's talk about some other advantages that you probably have figured out yourselves from my example, but we'll just, we'll just talk them through. So in Waterfall, that team spent a lot of time and money developing software that ultimately wasn't that helpful to the end users. There was stuff in there that worked, but there's a lot of extra waste and bulk and things that didn't work. And ultimately, it maybe doesn't provide the, the greatest user experience overall or really deliver the value. And it was also two years later, right? Like it took a really long time before they saw anything. In Agile, we avoided wasting that time and money because there's, there is situations, and I've been in situations like this before, where all the users are saying we want all this stuff, but once you give them create, edit, and delete functionality, there's a lot less users who are asking for stuff. Because a lot of the pain point, if you prioritize properly as a product manager and you identify the right thing to hit first and then to hit next, you can deliver a lot of value and you start to see that, oh, maybe we don't need all of this stuff. Maybe we only need to get to here and then we can be done, right? Or maybe there's still pain points, but they're just not big enough for us to spend time and money on. It's better to move on to the next thing. 
The other piece about Agile is that we learned a lot more quickly, right? So we went out in the field, we got some initial research, we scoped down what we were gonna build, and we pushed something out. And now we know it's like, they use mobile, and everyone's telling them to go to mobile, but they all you know, really prefer desktop, right? And so hopefully that's been figured out earlier in that, that Agile user testing process, but we've only spent a month building the thing. If we have to throw it away or it doesn't work, it's really not that big of a deal. And it happens a lot of times. Like at startups, that's sort of the whole point is you can just sort of like test it out, see how it works. If it works, great, you got a business. If it doesn't, you can iterate, adapt. If that doesn't work, you can move on to the next thing. But you haven't invested a ton of time and, and money and resources in it. The other thing is that we've never had a situation where we were, we, where we in Agile, where we weren't delivering value to the user on a regular basis. And that's a really big piece of this because you build user trust and you're delivering that value and it's gonna keep you around. If you're an outside consultant working with them, they're gonna be much happier with you. And if you're an internal software team, you're gonna get a lot of credit and clout and responsibility and that's gonna open up new opportunities and new opportunities to deliver value to your users, et cetera. Um, but that's a big deal, especially in the world we live in to deliver value more quickly because things change really overnight. You know, and so if it takes you six months or a year or two years to build something, the world has moved on while you haven't. Right? So we started with the skateboard and we go, oh, they're not very good at balancing, let's say. So let's give them a, a handrail or whatever it is. Um, I'm going to go back to this example to further that point. So this would be like an iterative way to make the Mona Lisa or to paint the Mona Lisa in the sense that if a, if a customer has a pain point, which is that like, I hate that bare wall and I need something to fill it, right? By giving them this, they're gonna be like, hmm, it's not great, but you are delivering some level of value. It may not be as valuable as this, but most customers are okay if you say, start with this, let us know how it goes, you are getting some value out of it, we will work towards that. Right, but so the other piece, and this goes to the learning point, is that the Mona Lisa in this example started by smoking a cigarette. And the customer said, no, 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 this is a smoke-free household, so we can't have that here. And so now Mona Lisa isn't smoking anymore. But if we had done this in a more waterfall-y fashion where we have just done the first square up here and then the next square over here and the next square over here, we would have never known that the user's really not into smoking until the whole thing was made. And so that is a way that, again, if they go, you know what, you're a really bad artist, you're still delivering value at this point, right? And that's a really important piece of agile or user-centered iterative software development. Okay, so that was one piece, this incremental versus iterative. The other piece is about risk exposure. And this is very, this resonates very strongly with startups or smaller companies who don't have the cash to really just like, we'll, we'll sort of figure it out down the road. But frankly, even at big companies, uh, it's not always necessary to take on a ton of risk if there's ways to mitigate it. And Agile's a really good way to mitigate risk. Because what you're doing is that, one is you're delivering value, right? In that Mona Lisa example, like you made some money off that picture. So you can keep going as a business, whatever it is, versus in, uh, let's say that top example with the car, you're not making any money. You're just sitting in debt. You know, you're just accruing more and more debt as a company until that's released and you're betting big on that thing. So if you look at the, this is like a classic chart. Um, and actually this drawing with the Sharpie and stuff is just very classic, but you would see like with the waterfall note taking example or with the car example that I showed before, you're just accruing risk over time. So this is risk and this is time. You're just accruing risk the entire way. And then once you release, boom, your risk is gone if you deliver value. But alternatively, if you do the skateboard, the bottom example, skateboard to the car, you give them the skateboard, no more risk. You give them the scooter with the handles, no more risk. You give them the bicycle, no more risk. And so you've been making money and you've been learning all along the way, but that's a really significant advantage, especially again for smaller companies uh, because they can't afford the risk, right? Like they're already taking a big risk by being a small company. 
Um, okay. The, the next piece I, I want to mention is that even though you go and talk to the users and you sit down with them and you really know them well and you go out and get drinks and maybe a little bit too drunk one night and whatever it is, it is really, really, really hard to know what a customer wants, to know what a user wants. And even if you sit with them and even if you watch them for hours and hours and hours, you can find examples all over the internet and I'm telling you from personal experience, you think you know what they want and it's different. So this is a really funny, classic, again, cartoon about, it's sort of like different people's perspective of the same thing. Um, so it shows like how the customer explained it because they're not always necessarily so good at telling you what they want, how the designer designed it, how the project leader understood it, uh, how the programmer wrote it, wrote it and what the customer really needed. But so in Agile, you're at a much lower risk of, of falling into this situation because you're checking and testing the entire time. So let's talk about practical strategies that you can use in your daily role, regardless of whether you develop software or not, to start thinking in a more um, user-centered, iterative type of way. Okay, so the, the first piece is that having a better understanding of Agile and user-centered design principles will uh, be incredibly advantageous to you as you if you want to start embarking on this journey of executing and using these principles in your daily practice. I know that sounds obvious, but there's an incredible amount of very rich material out there, especially about really both. But user-centered design, there's some really amazing resources um, that are just valuable to give you perspective on sort of how to do things. In addition to that is that you can't, most of the time you can't do all of this alone. You're gonna to have to work with other people in order to get things done. And you, as the advocate for these practices, need to be able to speak to them, understand the terminology, explain their value, and uh, implement them. And so if you have a really strong conceptual understanding, then you can start looking for opportunities to use them and sort of onboard or convince people to use them. So that's uh, one piece. The, the next thing is, again, regardless of what type of role you're in, you could be in sales, but it's to talk to your users or the people you are trying to deliver value to on a regular basis. And if you're in a software environment, advocate for designers or try to find a designer in your organization because designers, user experience designers, UX designers is typically what they're called in organizations, are literally trained, um, an incredibly knowledge in the art of talking to users. A user experience designer, literally their job, from my perspective on a team, is to speak on behalf of the user. So they are supposed to have a very rich, deep understanding of your users, and it's frankly very difficult to talk to users. There's so many traps. You can bias your users, you can steer your users in the wrong direction. We talked earlier about how you can put your users in a situation where, yeah, I love your thing, but they really don't like it. And a designer has the expertise to navigate all these different situations. And a designer will have a lot of these different techniques like paper prototypes and wireframes and know how to write a user interview script, et cetera, which frankly are very hard and nuanced things to be able to do. Uh, so it's great to have a resource there who knows how to do it. Okay, so the, the other piece is thinking about implementing as a thin slice of value. It's very easy to start from A and go to Z, but there's something from A to Z or multiple things from A to Z that deliver a lot more value than other things. And this ta starts talking about prioritization and where to start as a product manager, but I try as a product manager to always be thinking about how can I deliver a small slice of value? Not an incremental slice, not an incremental step, right? It's not just the wheels, but an iterative slice of value. And you can really start getting creative here in terms of how you deliver that value. Um, it, it takes time to sort of gain that muscle, but you'll start seeing opportunities as you keep working on it. Test often. Right, we talked about this like you're, you're going out talking to users, but this testing often, getting feedback, coming back, iterating on that, that's a really important thing. Just always going and checking with the users, talking to users on a regular basis. These techniques, methodologies, practices are very difficult. I mean, I've been trying to do this stuff for a long time and like I screwed up today. 
they're really, really hard to execute properly. So you got to keep, tr at least from my perspective, you have to keep trying and over time you do get better at them. They get easier. You're like, oh, I've made that mistake before, but you have to keep trying. They will pay dividends um, pretty quickly. And the last piece is that you have to be patient with the process. If you're trying to introduce these methodologies or concepts into your organization or into your teams, there's a, a lot of people who are gonna be very skeptical or sort of like nod their heads, but actually inside saying no type of thing. There's gonna be people who are gonna be very skeptical, resistant to change, unfamiliar with how to do things in a different way. And you have to be patient with all these different stakeholders and users, because otherwise it's sort of like, you just throw up your hands and you say, I'm done. That agile thing is such a dumb idea. And you go back to the old way of doing things, but it does take time to break old habits and develop new habits. Um, and so uh, you just have to be a little bit patient. So with that, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you.